You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt, director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin our proceedings here today by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us. So I call out first to your ancestral helping spirits and to my own. I call out to those people who were here before us, who lived well, who died well, who met the challenges of their time, who learned how to be good human beings and bring all that is good and true and beautiful in that great legacy to us, the living. And may we learn to reach out to these ancestors and ask for their assistance, to draw deeply into those practices that remain strong and true, that do support us in the world, in how to be good humans, and that we innovate and change and grow beyond those things that have proven to not be sustainable, to not be in the best interest of all life, those things that put our future and the future of our children's children in jeopardy. And we ask these ancestral energies to be with us here today as we reach beyond the humans, to those energies that were here long before there was ever a human and will be here long after, to those energies that make up the web of life that is around each one of us. Let us reach out to the spirits of the land and the great spirits of the land and all that is sharing earth, air, fire, and water with us. And we reach out to these energies and ask them to help us to remember who we are, who we as humans are meant to be and to surrender into that deeper true nature that allows us to resonate with the dreaming that is moving through us and singing us into existence and reminding us why we are here. So we ask all of these ancestral helping spirits in their many forms to be with us here today as we reach out to call ourself into presence here today, drawing ourselves from wherever we might be into our heads, from our heads into our hearts, from our hearts into our bellies, and from our bellies, let's take a moment, stop multitasking, focus on one thing, to touch the earth with your mind, your heart, your hand, if you can, and give thanks, to give gratitude to the earth for this day, gratitude for your life, gratitude for the incredible beauty and diversity around all of us, wherever it is that we might be, And gratitude for the fact that we can change anything as long as we are still breathing. We give enormous gratitude to the earth for the miracle of life itself. And as the gratitude pours out of our hearts, let us reach deeper in, letting our gratitude touch layer after layer of the earth as we reach down towards the very center of the earth and anchor ourselves firmly there. Let's take a moment and focus in to those energies so essential in our lives for their nourishing and replenishing qualities. Let us reach into those energies that draw their power from darkness, from silence, from stillness. And reach deeply into these energies and draw them up into our life, drawing into our life restoration and rejuvenation to replenish ourselves and draw up the nourishment that supports all that we have come into this day to be. We call the energy of the earth up and we ask that energy to help to teach us to understand where we stand, who we are. And what matters, what has heart and meaning, and to build our sense of home and our sense of belonging on that which matters deeply and truly to our hearts. And let us do so in a way that we challenge ourselves to open to those who appear different than we do, who look and think in other ways, and we ask those people to share with us, to share at our table, and help us to grow into the men and the women that we were truly meant to be. And as we learn in this way to connect with aspects of ourself inside, others outside, to better connect with our environment, and to better connect with the invisible world, 
We call out to the energy of the earth to assist us in this understanding of the great interconnectivity of everything. And let us reach all the way into that sense of oneness and find ourself in that great web of life and take our sense of right relationship from that place in the all that is. Then from that place, let's reach our energy up, up from our bellies to our hearts, our hearts to our minds, up and out the top of our head into the sky and whatever weather it holds for you in this day. And out through that weather into the atmosphere, the atmosphere out in the cosmos and all the way up to the highest power of the universe. However it is that you understand this energy by whatever name you call it, reach to that radiant divine energy, connect in it, let it connect with you and draw it down. Drawing it into your day, into yourself, into these proceedings. And in this way, you call in the essence energy of blessings and protection. Call in the benevolence of the universe. Calling in that which inspires and illuminates the way. We call these energies in. Drawing them into our head, our heart, our belly. Sending them down to the center of the earth. And in this way, we allow heaven and earth to connect. The earth and sky, these two great legendary lovers, let them connect within us and in that big love of these two great energies, these ancient, ancient ancestors. We let our own hearts be awakened by the spirit of their love. And as our heart awakens, let us bring that crucible of transformation that lives in the human heart online, drawing up the fiery passions of your belly that know why you are here, whether you do or not, and draw down the crystal clarity of your mind that can look around you and begin to figure, how are you going to do it in your day and in your time? And let these two energies kind of dance a wild tango there in your heart, moving up against each other in this dynamic tension that gives birth to this third and most sacred thing that you carry, which is some sense or memory, some inkling of why you are here. And may you find courage in that very same beautiful human heart to do something in this day, large or small, to bring those gifts into manifestation. For all of the abundant spirit help that we have to bring our gifts into manifestation in this life, I give great thanks. May what needs to be said be said here today and what needs to be heard be heard and may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. I want to give special thanks to those beautiful living things, you audience members who have taken upon yourselves to make sure that Why Shamanism Now stays alive and well. This podcast is free for, and the archives, which are now over 450 hours of podcasts, free for anyone who can get onto the internet anywhere in the world. And it is because of listeners like you that allow this to be listener-supported radio. And I want to give thanks to Lisa, Brian, Zoe, Mariah, Lucy, Erica, Eleanor, Adele, and Nijlan, All of these people that have been able to donate financially to the show, if you are able to do that, you can go to whyshamanismnow.com. Donate any amount, large or small. You have to scroll down a little bit, but you can find it. We take any amount, any currency. We are deeply grateful for it all because it all keeps the show on the air. And uh, for those of you that are not able to donate financially, be creative. There are many, many ways that we support the things that we love, the things that matter to us, the things that move us in our heart. And be creative. Find some way to bring that which matters to you into greater manifestation in your life. And for all of your efforts, large and small, we are deeply grateful. So I'm very excited today. I've been waiting for months for this show. Uh, We have one of my favorite guests, Kelly Harrell, with us today. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. Yeah, and Kelly has a new book. Yay! Yay. (laughs) The Runic Book of Days. So for those of you that don't know, there are several shows with Kelly um, in the archives. um, K-E-L-L-E-Y-H-A-R-R-E-L-L. So for those of you that don't know, if you go to the whyshamanismnow.com site, it's a little easier to search through the shows than it is on iTunes because there's a guest section and you can just find the guests by their name. It's the simplest way to find them. Kelly is an author and a modern shaman in, is it Fuquay Varina? Is that right? Fuquay Varina. Wow. North Carolina. 
<laughs> a Kelly is a lifelong intuitive and dream walker. She has worked with a local and international client base since 2000. She holds a master's in religious studies, is an ordained interfaith minister, and her work is nature-based. It is focused through the lens of animism, sitter, and druidry. She works closely with the elder Futhark runes and divine nature spirits of eastern North Carolina. Her shamanic practice is soul intent arts. Kelly advocates for social justice through sacred activism and is vigorously involved in the worlds in and around her. Today, she is here to talk about her newest book, The Runic Book of Days, which you can pre-order at Amazon.com. Um, you can reach Kelly at Kelly at soulintentarts.com. And it's K-E-L-L-E-Y. All right. So welcome back to the show. Thank you. I always love talking with you. It goes by so quickly. It does. So I'll get get on point here then. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start very simply. It's possible that there are people listening that have never heard of a rune. So <laughs> would you give a really simple, just kind of basic overview of what the runes are for people who may not have really any idea? The runes are the ancient Old Norse alphabet. Or initially, people call them the Elder Futhark, and they were simply an alphabet. And they have been ascribed this incredibly mythical origin story that is what most people would be familiar with with the runes, which is that Odin, the uh, the the 2.0 version god from the Norse tradition um, hung on the world tree upside down, self-sacrificed himself to obtain enlightenment, for lack of a better way to put it. And what he retrieved was an awareness of how to bring the runes into human consciousness, sort of as these keys of of mastery of life as a soul in form. So they're they're pretty significant and they um, generated many more recent futharks that have different alphabetic structures and different characters. And they are used primarily for well, see that's the thing. There's there's <laughs> <laughs> well there's there's no precedent historically for them having been used as divinatory tools. Um, what we have of them from a historic standpoint is what's been written about them in these few places called the Prose and Poetic Eddas, then Icelandic sagas, which are ancient texts of the um, just old Scandinavian region. But, but what we know about them is only because the younger Futharks, the multiple, not there is a younger Futhark, but all of these subsequent Futharks, we have evidence of them, how they were used and how they were pronounced. We really don't have anything on the elder Futharks. So there's no precedent for the elder Futhark historically having been used in divination, but that is primarily how modern people work with the runes. So basically, for those of you that have been around the block a few times, the the, the key unspoken understanding here is there are about, you know, like 150 academic rat holes we could go down. <laughs> well, yeah. Abs- or, yeah, or more, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, because there's there, it's an old thing, and there's a lot of <laughs> scholars, right? It's been around a long time for people to talk about, and right. people talk, right? People study, people research. Um, it's one of those things, and there's nothing, um, and I'm not diminishing that in any way, but part of what that means for us today as we go forward is there's not some kind of universal agreement or ultimate authority or anything like that that would um, make it simple. There's no Pope of the runes. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And in fact, you'll probably make somebody really angry by whatever thread you choose to go down because they're that passionate for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with that said, we only have one author on our show today, so we're going to talk about what Kelly's passionate about. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's in this beautiful new book. So um, 
let's just take a moment then and just talk about the runes as a divination tool. Just in the simple sense of that. So people get kind of an understanding of what does that mean. I think most people's perspective on divinatory tools is very framed by the tarot now, which isn't terrible, but it it's also leaving out a lot of the cultural nuance of something like the runes or even the I Ching, for example. But with the runes, um, there are 24 characters in the Elder Futhark. So I'm working with 24 runes. Each one has its own meaning, its own context and nuance. And when you put them together in, in the ordering that is traditional for the Elder Futhark, they sort of tell a progressive story. When you use them as divinatory tools, that story becomes even more nuanced because obviously you're not using them in the order that they are traditionally given in, but you're drawing them, you're casting them and applying them according to what your intention for doing the divinatory reading is. And so for for me, I would also say just from a practical standpoint, I find that as a shamanic practitioner, um, sometimes the things that I want most to get information on are things I am most upset about. Mm -hmm. And consequently, I don't do such a good job getting unbiased information. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. You know, we are the tool through which our information is having to pass into our awareness, uh, particularly when we are journeying, for example, or trying to sit in meditation. And so for me, a, a divinatory tool In other words, a physical object in my life that is not necessarily reacting to my emotional state to the degree that I am can be, for me, extremely beneficial when I'm trying to get a focus on something that is so upsetting to me. And so I, I feel that a practitioner who is really dedicated to receiving guidance from the invisible world and the and the natural world around them but that deeper invisible component of the natural world Mm -hmm. around us needs a tool because sometimes yeah we're not working very well (laughs) absolutely yeah you know i get i can get really short-circuited especially about the things i'm most passionate about so this is partly you know i haven't really done a lot on why shamanism now about different divination tools i realize as i was getting ready for today's show and so um I think that that's an important thing is is whether you're casting bones or doing the I Ching or, you know, whatever tool you're using that is part of your tradition that you have some physical object that can work for you when you're not working. Separate. I think that's hugely important. I get a lot of grimaces from my mentees. I never know what word I should use there. But I, I get a lot of... Um, like blank stares when I say, you know, we get into the second part of the first year. This is a spoiler alert. But one of the things that I kind of, you know, force everybody to do is start working with a divination tool. And, you know, when you have this conversation in the broader modern shamanic community, you get a lot of, you know, upset people also because they're like, that's not part of shamanism. And, you know, my experience is it, it, it is, but very, <laughs> very much the way you're saying it, it's when you can't get out of the way of, of what you need to hear. You need something that you have a relationship with that you know is going to deal it to you straight. And, and that relationship comes with use and, and with connecting and, and practice and discipline, just just like all relationships do. You don't just sit down and, you know, maybe you do, maybe you're that lucky person, but, but you, you find a tool, you find an oracle that wants to work with you as well, and you develop that relationship so that when you don't have clarity in your life, you're very passionate about something, you have this fallback ally that can say, Mm-mm, no, here's what you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so with that said, now, um, this particular book is organized into two parts, and the first part covers a history of the runes, organization, function, a, a, um, an enormous amount of gathering from different resources and sort of filtering it down into what 
you know, people need to think about basically to get themselves ready for the second part of the book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. And um, so why don't you share then about this design? What is unique about the design of this book of runes? What is unique about it is that I focus on the runic calendar, which again, lots of contention, lots of discussion around what that can be and what it should be. Um, I feel like the runes and, and any oracle that you want to work closely with, it is an animistic, re- a life force and perhaps life forces that you're engaging and need to come into deep relationship with. You need to understand what you bring to them and what they bring to your life before you start doing really big things with them. I mean, ideally, we want to know who who we're hanging out with before we start doing the big rituals and all that kind of stuff. So that's the first setup. That's the first part of the book is kind of that coming into relationship and giving you sort of a primer on what the runes are, where they come from, what they mean, and how they can situate in a modern context. The second part of the book is working very closely with the runic calendar. And yeah, that that's that's where it, things get tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so that is also a thing that it seems to me in terms of your typical um, working with Oracle kind of tools that people might go out and purchase that it, it makes this book unique though and that you have have structured this uh, tool and calendar for people contemporary people to use in a way that is real and engaging in their contemporary life right and and I think it's important for me to say at least it's not my structure I wish I was that like suave, but I'm not. Um, The structure was created initially by work that Freya Oswin did many, many years ago in correlating different runes to um, stellar aspects mentioned in these ancient texts that we talked about earlier. And then Nigel Pinnock came along and took that work a little bit further and started relating to actual runic calendars that, that existed, that still exist. And correlated them to the the Gregorian calendar in such a way that we could make sense of it. Because ultimately, in in historic context, there was no one runic calendar. It was it was that dynamic. It was that animistic that it, it literally was where you stood. And at least as far as we know, the first full first new moon after Yule that's when the runic calendar would begin. And and they were different based on different regions, based on how different cultures revered time cycles. So in, in some cases, they were solar and lunar. And based on what the season of that particular region was, so they were diverse. There was no one runic calendar. So a lot of people hear me say runic calendar, and they're like, whatever, that's not got precedence. Well, it does and it doesn't. It it does from the standpoint that it was a lot more nuanced than anything our brains could handle now because we have a very linear sense of time and timekeeping. So Nigel Pinnock worked with what I present as the runic calendar in my book. And what I bring to that is how to use that on a daily basis to use the runes in a seasonal progression of spiritual growth. So the other thing is, is in reading the book, it is apparent that this isn't Kelly thinking, Oh, this is such a great idea here. Let me write a book. That's going to be popular that this is actually something that you do (laughs) in your life yourself, (laughs) that this is a practice that you have, that has evolved in your own life over years, and you're finding that is something that is useful beyond your own personal proclivities, right? Your own personal taste, yeah. Yeah. 
they're not definitory tools for me in that, you know, here, let's see what they say since anymore. They were. I didn't know how to use them any other way. But when I started reading Freya's work and Nigel Pennock's work, a light bulb went on and I found this life application that that walked with me. It wasn't something that was random based on, you know, what information I needed in the moment. It actually you know, lit a path before me that I could see and continue following. And that's the motivation behind the book. Okay, so I'm, I'm quoting Kelly now from the book. So, whether used for the self or in service to others, the runes continually reflect the collective in the individual, the unknown in the known, and the personal embodiment of the unknowable in all things, the aspect of mystery in nature that we also embody. This heart of mystery is at the crux of the spiritual path based on Old Norse cosmology. Likewise, this cosmology isn't a static thing of the past. Rather, it's a living, evolving worldview, and its inhabitants are very real and engaging. So, um, could you share with us a... Just a personal story that il- illustrates how um, this old cosmology became real for you in the present, not just something of the past, a static thing of the past, as you said, and it became something that was real and engaging for you today. I think technically we might have lost Kelly. Um so I'll ask her that question when we get her back. So, so it looks to me like we have Kelly back. Is that true? So it would seem. Ta-da! <laughs> Fabulous. Thanks for coming back. Oh, thank you for your patience. <laughs> I'm wondering and which strange energy <sighs> in, that, in the universe. <laughs> Maybe it means we're actually starting to make change, Kelly. That's what I like to think. Oh, I like the way you think. <laughs> All right, so what we were asking before we were so rudely interrupted by whomever that was is um, I was asking if you had a personal story about when the light bulb went off and you realized that this um, old Norse cosmology was actually not static but was really living today and it became very real and engaging for you. Huh, you ask hard questions. I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, I think for me, these things always occur in a shamanic context Mm -hmm. that for that's, I mean, I think it has to hurt for me in order, in order for me to say, oh, this is relevant. Um, in, in moments that I'm not expecting, which is to say sort of traumatic moments, um, the second time that the first time was similar. But the second time, most recent, at the end of last year, I was having a medical procedure done. I was sitting on the end of the table, just kind of waiting for the whole thing to get started. And I had been having this feeling like something needed to level up for a few months. I just had this feeling and I didn't know what it was. And I was trying to force it. I was trying to figure out what it was and make it happen. And that it never works that way. And I'm sitting on the end of this table and I'm I'm worried about all of it. And just clear as day, I had a vision of myself standing in a a forested area and this um, voice that I have heard all of my experience with the runes. So, you know, 24, 25 years at that point. And it becomes evident to me that this voice is Heimdall, who is the keeper of the bridge between the human and God realms in that cosmology. And suddenly the runes erupted out of me and they started spinning like on an orbit and they have been there ever since. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So, um, talk, talk, talk people through like what one of the first sections, you know, because you have a little section like telling your story or allowing joy. These are the, 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 uh, half moon chunks of moving through the runic calendar. Right. So, 
talk people through about what what they're receiving because they have the the explanation or the the talking about it basically but then there's the devotional piece and the affirmation and and then once once we give people kind of an example of that then I'd like to talk a little bit more about the whole journey as initiation well the way that the book is structured in in the calendar portion is broken down by half months, which are like about two weeks um, at a time. And and there's a rune that is sort of the the focus of each half month as you progress through the calendar. And so each half month has a very refined personal focus for things that you can take into consideration, things that you can be working on or incorporating into your relationship with the runes themselves or just kind of in whatever's going on in your life at that time. But this is all occurring against this backdrop, this calendar backdrop of what the rune in its native season on the wheel means and what it brings. So there's always kind of this sense of native support that's available seasonally. And as you work with that, as you kind of pull those pieces together through the half months, this is kind of another sticking point of the book, this idea of Sabbaths, this idea of um, punctuated nature observances, which general paganism has sort of conscripted into this Celtic model, this Celtic ideology, which is not accurate. It's not um, it's not thorough, I guess I should say, when in reality, all cultures around the world have some observation of these natural alignment days. And so I still had to kind of do this crosswalk of how everybody refers to them colloquially and how the Norse culture would have more likely revered them and how we actually work with them in the everyday life. And what they bring is the opportunity to work through these devotionals in the half month, this personal work, this rune work, and engage in some deeper personal ritual around those things that you're learning. And for me, my language for that would be initiation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's, that's just kind of the structure that I applied to them in the book. Well, they're, they're, so what, as you were talking, I was thinking about having been north of the Arctic Circle in late June, many years ago, and how experiencing the season of June was profoundly different at a place on our earth where the sun was literally not going down. <laughs> right, right. So, right, right, and so I think sometimes when we live in places where even though we may be going through our seasons, we're still air conditioned and heated and buffered from the deep experience of the season, very much so, m- much more so than our ancestors, wherever they might be from, um, that we don't, it, 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 it I mean, it's hard to actually understand, in a sense, as a contemporary person, what you're saying about really looking at being engaged with the seasons around me in two-week increments. You know what I mean? Right. Right. And that how, if I was engaged, or, I mean, I guess this is a piece about the book that I appreciate, is that sense of, this is a calendar, we're on a globe, we're basically moving through it, all of us, in two week chunks of time. But you live wherever you live. And these these runes speak to human issues that are big enough to embrace all of us, but you need to engage with them in a way that is real where you are and what you actually experience at this part of the year. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. that giving people not just the permission, but the strong instruction, <laughs> right? To, right? To be both old and new at the same time. 
And I think that's what exactly we have to do. I mean, we, we, we can take this ancient precedent and say, okay, here's, here's what we think they would have done with this. Here's how they would have honored it. Here's how we know they carried forward their rituals and ceremonies of these sacred days. But I'm not in the Old Norse time. I'm not in Northern Europe, not even now, let alone thousands of years ago. I, I'm in Eastern North Carolina. I'm looking at Bermuda grass and sidewalks. And yet I feel called ancestrally and just whatever called to this path, to this observation. How am I going to make it work? I mean, th- that's the challenge of, I, I think, of, of any of us who are trying to deal with that brokenness of the modern, perhaps even modern animistic path, and, and also learn what these oracles have to say, what they can bring to our lives at this time. Yeah. And so, so why don't you pick um, like a, anywhere, anywhere in this cycle, a, 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 one of the half moon times, one of the two week chunks of time and the rune associated with it. And then the, the, the sort of story of moving from one into the next so that people can get a sense of what you're really talking about. Well, let's see. I think the one that probably stands out to me the most is, um, is Salon, which is, you know, what people would refer to as Halloween and um, the rune for that is Hagalaz, which is the rune that begins the second et. And it's it's a hardcore rune. It's a rune that a lot of people see it when they do readings and they just cringe. A lot of people do that with a lot of the runes. But, um, <laughs> but Hagalaz itself is somewhat about things breaking and about realizing that they're going to stay broken, at, at least in this part. It's not going to revive. It's not going to come back. And we have to face certain shadow in that. You know, it's never about the external thing that isn't working properly. It's about how it impacts us. It's about how it makes us feel and how it makes us deal with aspects of ourselves. And so the initiation for the Samhain Sabbath, which I'm not going to go into, you have to read it, but mm-hmm. it's it's about dealing with fear and uncertainty. It's about, you know, when things aren't going to play out the way that you have thought they were going to and how you're going to, to go into that and let yourself be tender around it and, and change so that you can come out of this somehow grown, <laughs> somehow able to show up and do. And then what's the affirmation associated with that one? That one is um, between darkness and light is the wisdom of balance, the embrace of peaceful unknown. Mm, Nice. So then it flows into in the next two week time. The next one. Yeah. So it, it cycles into not these, which is the second of what is considered a winter rune. And each of these each of these three winter runes they're a little bit on the intense side but from at least from my perspective the initiation phases the the eight initiations that are covered in the books with the sabbats those are the ones that are really demanding that you get down to brass tacks in your spiritual practice so you come through this experience of Hagalaz and Samhain in this initiation and you have a little bit of downtime with not these you have a little bit of opportunity to say okay it's okay that i haven't chosen a side yet it's okay that i've come through this i'm going to let it process And I'm going to sit with it and be comfortable with not identifying with any specific aspect of myself now. And the affirmation associated with that one? Not these is from the middle. I see myself on all sides. Nice. Okay. Thank you. So I'm hoping for those of you listening that, that this gives you a sense that this is just not another book of how to interpret the runes, but this is a book of another way to use them in your life as a way to engage, as I was trying to say, in that which is 
old and yet still resonates because humans are still humans on the same planet that is still spinning through the same universe in the same galaxy. Sorry, I left out the galaxy, right? And so, uh-huh. so those things may be evolving, but they are evolving together. Their relationships are constants. That, this is my sense of where the old things that remain true for us why they remain true. They're part of that constancy, and yet the living still born into their own time that has its own uniqueness. They bring their own medicine for that time. And so it, what, I, what I really appreciate about, appreciate about this book is how it guides people in this way of having a foot in the old world in a way that is not trapped in arguments, debates, and form – but is in the meaning, the deep archetypal, deep um, in, initiatory meaning in these things and, a lot, and gives you the responsibility to make that bridge into your contemporary life. How do I, like you said, the brass tacks of my practice, how do I allow this to guide me in the transformation I need right now in this body, in this time, mm-hmm. to do the work that I've come to do in the world? And not use my spiritual life as this place where I'm good. I need to heal first before I can go be useful. It's like, no, <laughs> you yeah. need to be useful today. Um, so, is there any particular myth about the runes that you would like to take a minute and bust? No. Like, the runes are so dark and scary or something well, like that? Or do you want to just move on? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good one. That is a really good one. But I think that it would be remiss not to talk about how the runes have been misused. And that is what shades a lot of people's perspectives on not using them now or it, or it, it, it runs them away from them now. And I mean very specifically how white supremacist groups have um, conscripted the runes, and in particularly specific ones, to use as their propaganda. And I would probably not have had this conversation. I would have said, oh, yeah, that's a thing that happened, except that it happened last year. It was in the news with runes, runes in the news, and not for a good reason. So I, I feel like that is... Um, a, a pretty good one to talk about the the theosophical movement which started under um helena blavatsky that's really where the runes got their uh, initial misuse she conscripted that into part of her perspective on root races and how uh, different root races were worthy based on certain characteristics and some were of course more worthy than others And that became the basis of white supremacist ideology um, in the early 1900s, and clearly it hasn't gone away yet. And so as someone who is also a scholar of the runes, it sounds to me like that is a very contemporary, um, here, let's find you know, sort of like fake history, fake science to support the stance mm-hmm. we're trying to take. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it doesn't sound like that is something that is inherent in the runes in their origin story. Exactly. And, and thank you for putting a point on that. Yeah. And, you know, and what's interesting to me, I'm sorry, I just find this so absurd. <laughs> what, what people today, especially people that are focused in politics and religion, miss when they do this is that they're usually talking about a time when gods were walking the planet, not humans. So that's just the thing. It's like, right. <laughs> you know, they're acting like Odin was a guy. Yeah. You know, it's like, He's no. Just a dude. Just a dude. No, Odin was not just a dude, you know. I mean, granted, it helps to, you know, cast Anthony Hopkins or whatever but no <laughs> it, it's just like there, there's this beautiful representation of this time in China where they talk about there were so many deities wandering around that you had to be good to everyone because you never knew if that old woman for example was one of the manifestations of an otherwise beautiful deity okay. or that dog was a manifestation of some god. And so you never knew because they're all shapeshifty. And and I just find it so odd that 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 political and religious people would draw on this really magical time as some sort of scientific proof of anyway. Sorry. Yeah. 
yeah. going off sideways. But um, so, but what do we do? You know, then what do we do as contemporary people when we we look at um, good work being done around something, and yet then realizing, wow, that person is. Um, Showing up with biases I didn't know they had is showing up and advocating beliefs I can't stomach. You know, how do we, how are we all going to go forward at this time where it's just not so simple about black and white and good and bad? I think we have to get off our butts foremost. You know, you can carry all the ideologies that you want to about, you know, I'm an ally and I'm inclusive and all that stuff. But if you're not out there saying it where the people who are being excluded and who need an ally can't hear you, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So so what do we – I guess my other question is, you know, what do we – how do we begin to think about the the you know how do how do we under, decide i guess we have to decide for ourselves what do we forgive how do we forgive in a way that allows us to learn and go forward and what is not acceptable like in a yeah. sense not forgivable what can't happen anymore it's not an option Right, because it is so divisive and so toxic, there's no way for us to keep doing, you know, keep allowing that to be done. It, it is, um, I feel like the conver- some of the useful conversations that could be being had get stopped because people get into this black and white place instead of realizing we are living in the gray, in the yes. unknown and the uncertain in the middle, and we have to start making decisions. And I, I guess my question would be, can we reach into things like the runes or the I Ching or these tools to guide us in that? Do our ancient ancestors have have guidance for us as, as their descendants? I think they absolutely do. And, and I feel like um, our lack of death walking, our lack of doing ancestral work, the clearing, the releasing, and the the turning to them as allies, they absolutely have wisdom that we need on exactly the topic of um, yeah, poor, poor elders and, and inclusivity. I, I think we have to reach back to them and find them. And if you can't find them, then that, that is a symptom in and of itself that says some healing work needs to be done so that that can happen. Yeah, yeah, because we all have ancestors that lived in a time when people of different apparent races lived together just fine. Right. And and that's an earlier history, you know, people don't necessarily bring up because it doesn't, you can't use it to support the hatred and the bias and the div- divisiveness of current time because it actually says, well, you know, before all that happened, we were all kind of living happily together <laughs> right and, and there's and there's wisdom in that there there is deep wisdom that we need and i feel like the the wounding that's in that gap is what we're seeing in some of the elders now who who are behaving badly who are abusing power it, it's just symptomatic of exactly that healing that needs to be done yeah so the first thing we do then is something that allows us to, to heal, again, not only my personal problem that happened when I was seven, but to heal in this larger arc of being a human that I believe that you're offering through uh, the Runic Book of Days, where you have a path that, you, that a reader can, can walk on to become a person who is not simply in your personal healing, but your own healing and growth and transformation is serving this larger arc, like I was saying, the old part of who you are, as well as the very current contemporary person that you are. 
that there's this larger arc. You can call it initiation. You can call it coming into true adulthood, whatever you want to call it. But this is a potential guide for people who are wondering, how do I not become one of those elders? How do I do this differently? It seems that's... It seems that's what you've offered us with this with this book. I'm just going to sit with that. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, Kelly sits with that. <laughs> I I feel uh, very strongly, obviously, that um, we we need to look at that next step. Those of us who are interested in shamanic practice need to be able to look at what is that thing that allows me or can guide me to go on this arc of healing that brings me into being one of those people who can have that kind of conversation, who can step in where the conversations need to happen and have it in a way that can create change. So... I want to give thanks to the ancestors that have gathered around us here today, to the earth below and the sky above. Give gratitude to the heart that unites us all. And I want to give thanks to you, Kelly, for your work here, your personal work that became the basis of this book, but also your authorship, your gift in writing. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. It's so great to talk with you. And I also want to give thanks to those crusty old North Norse gods. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. And that that which they've left for us, you know, carved, it literally carved into things so we could find them right? yeah. and, and um, find a way to continue to use these tools. And so I give enormous gratitude to the many energies that come together that have allowed Runic Book of Days to be available for you, contemporary person, now to purchase, to dive deeply into, to connect with Kelly where you get confused, and to work with others to begin to be the people our time is asking us to be. So thank you, everyone. Go buy a book. <laughs>